coming up next on The Health Hustle. Well, I'm sure everyone's different when they're younger, but um, for me, as a kid, I always, mainly by virtue of the influences in my life at the time, real healthy parents, my grandmother, um, I always kind of had a high self-efficacy and believed that I could achieve whatever I put my mind to. No one really ever told me I couldn't. And I think that I would say to the younger self, encapsulate that and hold on to it and carry it forward. Because even if you are young and you're starting your first business and you don't, you lack experience, being young and lacking experience shouldn't hold people back as much as they think. And, you know, you just get out there and you start experimenting, view it as an experiment, take some chances, take some risks, find some uh, mentors, some partners, some resources, and just get started because you're not going to get it right the first time. What up, y'all? Welcome to The Health Hustle, where I believe that just like your health, there is no one-size-fits-all model and that you should be able to create a business that fits your lifestyle. Over the years, I have brought on doctors, physical therapists, tech founders, serial entrepreneurs, influencers, athletes, everything in between to uncover how they built their business and the lessons learned along the way. If we haven't met before, my name is Corey Hibben, and I own a marketing agency that's focused towards helping health-related business owners to market and grow their business. If that happens to be you, the very first step you can take is actually signing up for my newsletter. It happens to be called the health hustle where once a week I write marketing tips that are specific for health related business owners or the other thing you can do if you're having difficulties getting leads is one of the most common reasons that I see this is not having a well-defined niche I've actually created a very simple three-step process that walks you through how to get clarity on which niche is best suited for you you can find the link to the free niche guide in the description of this episode have you ever wondered how a Texas A&M grad with a Stanford background in East Asian studies ends up building a thriving cold plunge business <laughs> Yeah, me too. Meet Stephen Haynes, a former management consultant turned entrepreneur who's passionate about community and intentional living. In this episode, we'll unpack his unique journey from early lessons in family entrepreneurship to the challenges and triumphs of starting his own business called Fjord Cold Plunge. Expect insights on game thinking, customer focus, and the surprising downside of asking too many questions. Stephen Haynes, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you, Corey. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited. I obviously do a lot of research with my guests before I bring them on. And you started your own podcast show uh, <laughs> where you sit into a cold tub while you're doing the show. And I have to know, because the longest one I saw was about 18 minutes, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, how cold is the water that you're sitting in it for 18 minutes? It can't possibly be in like the 30s. It's, so I, it's really funny. The very first episode we did was with Brent Drake. A buddy of mine is an ultra marathon runner and we actually, it was in the spring and we had the tub set to heat at the time I had a feature where it could be a hot tub. So if you notice closely in the video, you'll see the water steaming because it was uh, oh. about 98 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then, but my most recent one, we had it at 47 degrees and we did it for about 12 minutes with uh, Johnny, Johnny goes hard. So you never know, but uh, we're keeping it cold these days for folks that can handle it. Oh, I didn't know it had a hot and cold function. Not anymore. We got rid of it. Okay. Too, it was too problematic. Really? Like those, those, or those devices like just have a lot of problems if you try to do both hot and cold or what? They do. Most of the ones on the market that have a heat and cold feature, best to have uh, a heater that is, you know, programmed and, and especially dialed in to just do heat uh, versus try to like put a real small powered heater into one of those kind of all-in-one machines. We found that that just didn't work well. It just heats the water really slowly. What they were originally designed to do is keep water from freezing in the winter. Just heat it up enough to where it doesn't freeze in the winter for cold climates. Oh, interesting. Well, I feel like the way technology and AI and everything's going, I feel like it's a matter of time before they master being able to do the hot and cold thing. Cause yeah. I would love to have both. Like, cause I have a buddy that has a hot tub and it's one of those things where it's like, couldn't you just like also flip it to cold? But mm -hmm. to your point, obviously mm -hmm. not yet, but I'm sure it'll get there. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so let's pull back on you a little bit. So where I like to start with people is, uh, do you have any entrepreneurship in your family or are you the first one to start a business? Yeah. My dad's a serial entrepreneur. So he's started and currently runs, you know, five companies, um, everything from a cattle business to uh, a fencing business to a CPA firm and uh, real estate business he's got a bunch of different things so he's always kind of had that in him and encouraged me to to do that um for the longest time i put it off until you know a year and a half ago when i started my first company what took so long what's your resistance 
I was in a career that I was really enjoying. Uh, I was in strategy consulting ever since college for about 15 years. Got to travel the world, you know, would have not had as many great experiences seeing the world and working with really smart people and learning a lot about business had I not done that. And it just was such a great fit for me that I stuck with it for much longer than I probably anticipated that I would. Uh, and then it just felt right uh, to go ahead and take a risk and, and step into something new, uh, you know, about a year and a half ago. If I read correctly, I believe you said you're the first person to not uh, run a farm in your family or the first generation? First generation on my dad's side of the family to not grow up on a farm, oh, working okay. the farm. Yeah, my dad grew up on a farm in uh, outside of Flower Mound, Texas, and he had three brothers. So imagine the luck of those parents having three boys uh, to run the farm. And Some uh, strong boys on that farm. So I grew up going out there a lot and, you know, made sure I knew how to hunt and ride a horse and fish and you know, enjoy land. Uh, but we grew up in the suburbs. So I was the first generation to not grow up on the farm. Do you wish you would have grown up on a farm? You know, life would have been quite different, but, uh, kind of glad yeah, I had a great childhood. So really no regrets. Hmm. The only reason I asked that is, uh, just to give people context. Steven was lucky enough to come out and spend a little time on the farm with me and experience the, the longhorn, the chickens and the goats. And, you were thriving, man. Like you, you were having a good time out there. So I, I did, didn't know if that was something you wish you would have done. It was a treat. It was a treat. And I really like animals. So it was great to be around the goats and yeah. uh, get to know them. We got to know them up close. <laughs> oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me more about your father then. So I'm, I'm curious as to, uh, so you said he had five, he has five businesses that he's currently running. Yeah. Um, has that always been lucrative and good for him? Has he had stumbling blocks along the way when you were growing up? Like, what did that look like to you? Did you have any fears around it? Yeah, I think when I was growing up, he was mainly focused on growing his own CPA business. And that was kind of the core focus and the core business and what took care of our family growing up. And then when my grandfather passed away, uh, there was no one running the farm. And, you know, kind of he pretty much took over the operations and expanded it and kind of went back, almost like reverted back to what he was enjoying when he was younger. He loves being out on the farm. He loves the animals. Uh, he's excellent at doing it and knows what he's doing and um, believes in like high quality meat. So, you know, the way he raises them, he grass finishes them, is real careful about what he feeds them and what types of things go into their bodies. And so um, he's pretty passionate about health and about, you know, making cattle that, that are you know, really healthy. So every once in a while we'll slaughter one for the family and bring down a half a cow or something and share it among friends. And it's great. I need to meet this guy. He sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Um, it's funny. My, my girlfriend asked me recently, she's like, she's like, what business would you start if you weren't doing what I'm currently doing with the marketing stuff? And it was a great question. I was like, yeah. and I sat on it for a while and he was like, you know what? I would honestly, I'd probably, um, I'd probably do a farm. Mm -hmm. I would probably, I'd probably get really good at the content creation side of a farm. Cause I think honestly, when even like in Austin, I think there's a lot of amazing farmers that are doing a really good job of making a really good regenerative product. It's like organic, it's pasture raised and it's great. And it's people spend a lot of money for that, especially in a town like this where people are health conscious. Yeah. And so there's a massive demand for it. People want it. Um, it's very hands-on it's, it's, it seems like it's very rewarding work, but mm -hmm. based on what I've seen, they're not really that great at like the marketing, social content side of it. It's pretty like smart. And so I think I could do really well on that. Uh, and I think True. that's what I do. But yeah, that, that would be a good combination of skill sets there. Cause I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, they, they're a little bit separate. Totally. Which is fine. Um, you can't be good at everything, but I think that um, I could do the product and the marketing side of things really well. But um, with that in mind, the reason that I bring that up is that uh, you obviously stumbled into the cold plunge business, which we'll get into in a moment, but even like growing up or even maybe even recently, are there other business ventures that you've thought about or things you've wanted to pursue or things that you even tried pursuing when you were younger, maybe? Yeah, I was always really anxious to get out and start working. Um, so when I was my first job, when I was young, my dad's brother, my uncle, he, um, sold fireworks. He had a fireworks stand that he did right before new year's and right before 4th of July. And we'd run it for two weeks. And for a kid who was 13 years old, I'd take one of my best friends out there and we'd work this fireworks stand and we did not have any interest in getting paid in money. We're just like, pay us in fireworks. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you walk around with a big grocery sack and fill it up with whatever can fit in there. And then we'd take it out to the farm and blow things up. 
<laughs> so Hell yeah. it was a kid's dream. So, you know, I was always, I loved working when I was young and we started a lawn mowing business, me and the same guy, Austin Smith, we started a lawn mowing business and, you know, we're mowing lawns and, and just kind of trying to be scrappy and always, instead of working at a restaurant during the summers, during high school or college, I would go get a strange internship. You know, I worked for a land developer one time and it was interesting how I got the job. I, I thought I wanted to be an architect or a builder when I was uh, early in college. I was studying landscape architecture, some classes. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to work for a builder during the summer back in Dallas-Fort Worth. And I asked my dad, you know, do you know any builders? How can I do this? He said, why don't you just open up the yellow pages and look up, you know, builders and architects and just call them. And I probably made 50 phone calls, you know, 50 phone calls that got picked up and talked to people and asked, hey, do you have, uh, you know, an opening for your summer intern? I'd love to do this, love to learn about it, love to shadow you. And about four people, after about the fourth person said, you know, you should call this land developer named David Bagwell. Because a lot of these guys were building in his neighborhoods that he was developing. So I called David Bagwell and he's like, how'd you get my number? I'm like, well, I got it from Bud Sellers and from so-and-so. And he said, well, um, you know, how, how, what's your interest in this? Like, how did you get a hold of this? And I said, well, this is what I did. I called 50 people and they kept telling me to call you. So I'm calling you now. And he was like, I'll give you an interview. <laughs> wow. wow. He was just, you know, loved the hustle behind it. Did you end up getting that? And yeah, pursuing? I worked with them for two summers in a row. How'd it go? Learned a lot. Mainly I learned by listening to him talk. He was extremely intelligent, really good businessman. And he would take all of his calls in the office. We had this open office uh, set up so I could hear him talking at his desk and he would take all of his calls on speakerphone. Mm. So I could hear the back and forth and uh, just him negotiating and uh, working through you know issues with builders and stuff i was just like this is an education just listening do you f still use those lessons today and what are maybe some of those things that you learned when you were working with him and listening to those calls um he <clears throat> was passionate about having his neighborhoods be developed with a certain architectural and landscape standard that he had developed and all these builders were wanting to go outside of it so he's sticking to you know his uh, standards essentially, and just kind of negotiating back and forth and, and all that. And I also kind of learned, uh, when it comes to real estate projects, at least at that time, his perspective, he would show me the, the budget and the financial statements. And he would say, well, I don't really touch a project unless it looks like it's going to be 25%, mm. you know, operating income from it. Um, so I thought that was interesting kind of knowing how they would think about it, how investors would think about it. Learning through osmosis. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot to be said about just like getting around the right people um, and learning through just like spending time with them or like you were lucky enough to hear them through the actual phone calls through the speakerphone, which is, yeah, I think underestimated how valuable that is. Even something as basic as like something I'm honestly not good at and I wish I was better at is uh, recording my sales calls, like just hitting record before I take a sales call on Zoom or whatever. It seems rudimentary, but honestly, like when you go back and you look at it, you learn so much. I can imagine. Yeah. That's something I'm, I've definitely not been good at, but definitely something I recommend anybody do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's move forward here a little bit then. So that eventually led you to what happened next then? Ended up going to college or where did you go from there? Yeah. Went to Texas A&M and was, you know, not knowing what I wanted to do at first, you know, kind of looking at architecture, studying a lot of philosophy. And I took a lot of courses that never played into the major and then ended up in the business school. And once I got into the business school and I got into an organization there called Aggie Men's Club, it's like a men's leadership organization, met some great people and people that were, you know, kind of just believing in anything was possible. And I was like, this is my tribe. And I think I just learned a lot. I had some great mentors in that group that helped me get my foot in the door to probably lead me to where I am now. Um, one of those guys, you know, is well known in Austin now is Evan Loomis. He is a, a co-founder of Icon and a bunch of other, you know, funds and different things. And he's gone on to do great things. He was two years ahead of me and just really um, introduced me to certain people and acted as a mentor for whatever reason. He took me under his wing and it, it was hugely helpful for me in college and kind of put me on the path because what I was noticing at that time is all the top people in the business school that I was around, there was a funnel going to Wall Street. Everyone was going to New York, 
to work in investment banking. This is 2006. And it was still a good market, you know, before 08. And the bonuses were big. You could make $100,000 and everyone was doing it. And I went, went up to New York and kind of did this short-term internship up there called Aggies on Wall Street. And you shadow a bunch of banks and you see what the life is like and you hang out with alumni that are there in their first year, second year, third year. And I just thought, you know what? I don't know that this is the energy for me, but I still want to do something competitive. And that's when I found out about management consulting. A&M just wasn't a target school for it. You know, all the top firms are recruiting at Harvard and Stanford and these other Ivy Leagues, and they have their choice of people uh, to recruit from. So in order to get attention and get an interview with one of those companies coming from A&M, you really had to be proactive and stand out. Um, I had some mentors that kind of helped me do that, but I created an organization at A&M while I was there uh, that's now called Horizons. It's still going on and it's a mentorship organization to teach A&M students what people at Stanford are learning in game theory classes, how to approach a case interview, how to think about it in a structured way, ask the right questions, break it down, make smart assumptions, do back of the envelope math, because without that skill set, it's a, it's a skill set that can be acquired. And it's just one that a lot of A&M students don't have, and it makes you not competitive to get into consulting. So this is my words, not yours, but I've heard you talk about A&M before. And is again, this, these are my words. Um, it, is it as culty as it feels like it is? I feel like it's one of those things where if you go there, you're just instantly part of this insider club. Is that true? It's true. <laughs> it's true. We are for some reason, uh, over the top loyal to one another, you yeah. know, yeah, I, I used to wear it. So I had an Aggie ring, these, you know, big old gold rings. I don't wear it anymore. I've got it at home. So for special meetings, but I used to always make sure I wore it when I was in consulting to oil and gas meetings because so often you go to Houston and meet with an oil and gas executive, shake his hand and you feel that clink and you, both of you already know this is going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about a and is it, I mean, obviously it's cultural, but like, where does mm -hmm. that stem from? Do you know? It, it sort of, uh, breeds it on itself. Like it's just, you go there and it's known it's part of the culture that we are the Aggies. We help one another. We're a family. Like uh -huh. this is about unity. It's about loyalty. And so you, you just, it carries forward. And for whatever reason, they call it the Aggie spirit. Yeah. And it's just something that is powerful for whatever reason among our alumni. It's, it's true in Austin, ironically as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is the first place that I've ever lived where there's a very strong sense of cultural community. Like I literally just had a zoom call with a guy the other day, never met him before. We've been sort of crossing paths, like through other people and people have been recommending that we finally, that we meet. And so we finally did. And it was like, it was a conversation of basically it was like, we were both like, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. It was like, what, like, can I, what's a great episode on your show? Cause we will podcast. It was like, what's a great episode I should listen. It was like, it's just so funny. It was like, oh, you're also from Austin. We're immediately going to try to help each other and be best friends. It's like, yeah, it's the weirdest thing, but I, I love that. And I also, I think that's true, especially among the wellness community in Austin that you and I are well plugged into. It's like, I've been surprised at how few people carry themselves with ego and how many people are there to all just be a part of something that's helping each other. Yeah. And I've met a couple of those people that have that ego side of things. <laughs> and it's funny because they get called out really quickly and yeah. all of a sudden, like everyone is kind of saying the same thing. They're like, kind of look out for so-and-so I would never call anybody out, but it happens. Right. Sure. Uh, I think it, it's just, it goes back to culture, right? I think the culture kind of just takes care of itself because of that. Yeah. Like there's almost this, this subconscious, uh, acceptance of certain characters or certain qualities in people. And if you're not in line with those, people are kind of like, Meh, like not really going to hang out with that person. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's as simple as being willing and, and open and of the mindset to just make genuine connections with people. Totally. Like let's, just actually be friends instead of how can I use your platform to help me? Totally. So can we give people a crash course on game theory? I've studied it a little bit, mm -hmm. um, both, both game theory and even consulting from that, from that standpoint, management consulting, as mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. um, I think those are commonly used maybe phrases, but mm -hmm. I think most people probably have no idea what it actually is. Can we mm -hmm. maybe give people a crash course on that? It's a way of thinking and, um, another word for it that gets thrown around is like war gaming. Like, let's think about different scenarios and how they could play out. Um, 
there's a lot of dependencies. So what I ended up doing in consulting is, you know, became a subject matter expert in building financial models and, and business models for companies. And you had to really, really understand their company well and use their own financial statements and stuff like that to really create a model that would be useful. But for a model to have value, it's only as valuable as the assumptions that are built into it. And so those have to be really informed assumptions and you can change those and tweak those assumptions and change the model as you go and as you learn. Um, I think game theory helps one think about what are all the different avenues that could play out and how might I think about my response if that does play out a certain way. And in case interviews, you know, you're just given an open-ended business problem and you immediately don't have enough information to even give a qualified answer. So an inexperienced person in that situation might start jumping to conclusions and giving answers. Whereas the right thing to do is to use that skill set to start asking questions and ask the right questions to get the information that you need. The whole time, the other person on the other side isn't necessarily expecting you to get a specific right answer. They're observing how you think and how you solve problems and what information you think you need to solve the problem. Do you have any case examples of this, of how you've maybe been able to do it with businesses you worked with or even your own business? Yeah. So one of the companies I worked with was an oil field services company called Baker Hughes. And um, they were number three in the industry. And uh, they were kind of happy to be number three. They just wanted to hold their market share and they wanted to become more profitable at the time. So when interviewing their leadership, you know, the case was you know, hey, we want to improve profitability in these two parts of our business. And how do we want to do it? So we teamed up with the chief strategy officer and came up with a way to go to market differently. We figured the, the lever to help this solve this problem, the most high leverage thing that we can put our energy into is actually coming up with a different way to talk about and sell the product, which is going to mean a whole shift in the way that the work, the, the sales force thinks about the product. So, you know, every time that I would work with the client, the ask would be different. Um, but the way to get to a solution is up to us to help carve out with the client. I love that. It, it kind of goes hand in hand with something that I study and think and work with a lot of clients on is just this idea of branding and making sure you're having the right messaging of what people actually want as opposed to what you think they want. And the only way you can figure that out is to gather enough data to figure something like that out. Like one of the best examples, people use it all the time, is actually Apple did it when they first came out with the iPod, is that they didn't say that we have a whatever 50 gig hard drive. We, they said you have a thousand songs in your pocket. Because mm. that's what people actually wanted, right? Is they wanted mobile music. They weren't talking about the how many gigabytes or how fast it was. They were giving people what they actually wanted. And that just comes down to understanding the brand and the market and what people are actually searching for and what problem you're actually solving. Yeah. Um, so it sounds very similar. Yeah. One of the like core fundamental tools that continued to just be useful on every project we did was the voice of the customer. So if you just think about an X and Y axis on the horizontal axis on the X axis, you have, what are the different care abouts for this customer? What are the things that they care about when it comes to this particular product category? And we would list them from things that were most important and weighted heaviest to the customer on the left, and then move to the right with things that were slightly less important, but still relevant. And then on the Y axis, you have your company's performance or you have, you have performance. How well are we performing in the things that are important to the customer? And with scarce, if you didn't, if you had unlimited resources, you'd want to perform high in everything, but otherwise you just want to be performing in a way that's optimizing where you're putting your resources is what the customer really cares about. And it's never perfect when we, uh, when we look at it in an honest way with a client, there's always room for improvement. One of the interesting things you can do with that tool is to take, after you plot yourself as a company on this, uh, matrix, you can also then take competitors and say, well, my top two competitors, where do they honestly land in all these areas? Are there areas where they're outperforming us that are important to the customer? Or are there areas where we've got a competitive advantage that we can now market that? Totally. And to tie that again back to branding, is uh, it, that goes hand in hand with positioning, is to understand like which of those things that you can put your resource in and to win in that category. For example, like 
Amazon has pretty clearly stated that they are the best at having incredible customer service and very fast delivery, right? So almost all of their resources go into partnering with shipping companies, getting overnight, even same day shipping, which is the craziest thing ever. It is. It's like, was it just in a warehouse down the street? Exactly. Which is crazy. But that's where all the resources go because that's what they know. That's what people want. I remember Jeff Bezos pretty distinctively saying, he's like, he's like, never are people not going to want faster delivery and better customer service. Like that, that's just never going to be the case. So they continue to push more and more resources into that understanding. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, so, okay. So you're, you were an Aggie cult member, um, <laughs> eventually made your way. Were. <laughs> I still am. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, eventually made your way out of there. And from there you did the consulting thing for a long, would you say 15 years? Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. Um, before we move on to this, uh, what I, what I want to get to next with that consulting piece, I want to quickly tie in, uh, the first time I ever learned about game theory, I think you might find this interesting. I was actually watching a Ted talk. And he was applying the idea of game theory to essentially just like human evolution. And he was basically saying, this is something that literally exploded my brain and my reality and the way I see the view, the view of the world ever since I, I learned about this. And he was saying, um, everything we see or experience, um, smell, taste, touch, whatever, everything in our environment isn't technically true. It isn't technically what you think it is. In other words, if you were to take my experience or your experience and a fly's experience and a deer's experience, we could all be in the exact same place, seeing, hearing, tasting the same thing, but it would all be completely different. So which begs the question is, okay, so which one of those are true? And the answer is none of them. <laughs> and what makes this so crazy and why this was tied to game theory is he was basically saying like, Evolution or mother nature, whatever you want to call it, uh, is only giving you what you need to basically survive and continue your DNA and to continue to push on your DNA through generation after generation after generation. So like whether it's quote unquote true or not actually doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that it's giving you whatever you need to function in your environment to allow you to pass on your DNA to the next offspring. Yeah. And it's like, what the yeah. hell? This is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. So it's like, if it's true or not, does it actually matter? But I think the just the more important takeaway that I got from it is that like, none of it's actually technically true, right? Whatever we are experiencing, we can't ever know it's truth. It's just whatever it needs to be to pass on your DNA. Yeah. Which is like, what the hell? All through our own lens and through our own filters. Totally. Blew my mind. Yeah, but, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, it was, I'll have to send you the TED Talk. It was like, what? Uh, this exploded my brain. That was the first time I ever heard about Game 3. Um, but anyways, so 15 years of consulting. Um, then eventually started a business. Before we get to that, though, uh, what's, what's maybe the big lessons you learned in all those years of consulting? And what are maybe some interesting stories of maybe clients you work with, companies you work with, something of that sort? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I learned was... The, the the role I had, especially the last company I was with, I was with for 11 years. It was a Swedish boutique company called BTS. Great company. Absolutely love it. Love the leadership uh, team. The colleagues are top notch. And um, one of the things that was true about my role in that company as I moved up, I was wearing a lot of hats. So I was in charge of managing the client relationship as well as coming up with the actual business models. I was in the whiteboarding room with the developers, whiteboarding out the concept for the business model and interviewing uh, you know, leaders to learn more about the business. And then I would be the one on stage delivering um, big presentations you know, over and over two or three days in a row. I'm actually going to do it next week in Connecticut for, for my old company. And one of the things I learned is there are parts of that, some of those hats that I was really naturally gifted at and I did, I excelled and did really well in. And there were some that I just kept dropping the ball on. It just wasn't uh, something that I enjoyed or wasn't naturally wired for. And I remember getting so much feedback and so much coaching on the parts that I wasn't doing well, um, you know, for the first few years at this company and my boss just, you know, kind of harping on me about it as he should. And then what, something shifted. I, I got to a certain level of, of seniority and I'm not even sure it had to do with that, but it was a certain amount of time I spent there with my boss then realized uh, he knew what I was not great at and he knew what I was good at and he almost stopped giving me feedback on that stuff and just started pairing me 
with people on my teams that were excellent at those things. And every time that that would happen, that team would, we would have a phenomenal project and it would do really well because I was freed up to do what I was best at doing and put my energy there. And I think that's something that can carry over hopefully for your listeners as well. Like focus in your sweet spot, find people that can help you in areas that you're not great at. Because I know as an entrepreneur, we try to do a whole lot, especially as a founder in the beginning. What is that for you? What is the area's zone of genius as it's often called? Oh, the, on the positive side. Yeah. So it's, um, I'm really, I've always been somehow wired to understand concepts really well. Um, so anything that's like conceptual, if I can understand something and internalize it, I can explain it really well. And that's boded well for me in this current business in terms of understanding what are the benefits of cold plunge? Why did, why is it beneficial? Why does it help? Um, and then also just the interpersonal piece. You know, I did a lot of working with people, a lot of presenting, a lot of trying to understand, hey, we have a whole world of information here in these in these slides and so many things I could do and talk about. What are the things that are going to move the needle for this person listening to me? What are the questions I can ask? Instead of giving the answer, what are questions I can ask that are going to help them come to the same conclusions or create a dialogue in the room among some of these different leaders that wouldn't otherwise be fostered in that way that creates value. Hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I like I was saying in the beginning of the show, I've researched you pretty extensively, and the conversations you had on other shows, yeah, you pretty you have a very strong grasp of the health side and the the research side and the benefits of your product and cold plunging and cold therapy and contrast therapy and all those things, almost respectively. So I was like, wow, like you know this pretty inside and out, which is great. It's awesome. Um, so how have you then been able to figure out to focus your energy towards that side of things? I guess two parts of this question is one, how have you been able to focus your energy towards that side of things and delegate the other side? And also two, do you feel like you're attacking the right problem? Do you feel like this is what people want? You know what I mean? Like kind of like what we were saying before is speaking the language of the customers and the mm -hmm. audience. Do you mm -hmm. think it's what they want? And how did you figure that out? It's, it's really interesting because we're all biased based off who we are. Like I w I'm kind of speaking to myself. I'm the type of person that is interested in biohacking and health and kind of went on that journey like seven years ago when my dad had his first heart attack. I became really interested in my uh, blood metrics and, and trying to move the needle in the right ways and what supplements work, what, do what doesn't, what kind of exercise. And then cold plunge became a tool in that tool belt that's been really important for me. And after doing all the research, um, I realized that it's a lot more helpful and potent across mental health as well as physical health um, than I originally even thought, which for me is important because it's part of the why of what I do in my business. I, I really want it to be something that I believe is giving value to the customer, you know, and going to change their life, you know. Yeah. Just to hit on that note of belief, I, I recently uh, stumbled upon this, just this idea of how important it is for the founder to truly believe in what they have to offer for people. Cause everything past you is just like a watered down version of that original vision. If you really think about it is like, hopefully nobody, I mean, maybe there, I'm sure there's exceptions. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but, um, generally speaking, the founder of a company is going to be the most potent version of that vision and that mission and they're going to love it the most and they should it's theirs right it's their baby or whatever you want to call it and so like you have to be so potent that every time you reshare that vision or that mission or where you're going or the product or service that you're selling that they're they're maybe only going to get 90 percent of it right which is fair right they don't own the company they don't own the business the product um but that's why i think that's just like so important to truly believe in it and even if you take that to like any sort of your marketing or your sales team is if they don't believe in it they're not going to market it. They're not going to sell it. Right. And so it's just so important. Yeah. And, and probably what, uh, comes before, you know, believing in it is, is understanding it, you know? So like I, I, I found I've worked with a number of different people, um, like fractional employee re relationships and I have some going on right now. And, um, one of the things that I've learned is through working with different people, some people after working with them, they're not, they don't really care about the brand. I don't feel like they really care about the brand or the product or the mission or, you know, the business. Um, but they're kind of going through the motions and they're creating work deliverables that have some value and so forth. But I really have found where I want to land is working with people that actually do have a personal passion for what we're doing and believe in the product and believe in what we're doing. And oftentimes you have to pay for that, right? Like, 
I think that's something too. I'm uh, one of my favorite authors, mentors, speakers, whatever, of all time, Darren Hardy. I don't know if you know who that is, but I've read all of his books. But he's one called Entrepreneur, or no, excuse me, the Entrepreneurship Roller Coaster. I think it is. Great book. If you're trying to get fired up about starting a business, read that book. Okay. Um, but there's a lesson in it about um, basically just hiring uh, a a star quality, like hire all stars. Because even if you're ending up paying six figures for this person, if they make you three hundred thousand dollars a year, it's a thousand percent worth it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, he's pretty he's pretty big on that. He's pretty bullish on like hire really valuable talent. I mean, it's one of the reasons that obviously there's stages to a business and you have to have enough capital to support it, etc. But oftentimes, when you're looking at the Googles or the Amazons, is there's a reason they spend like billions on recruiting and trying to get the best talent? It's because like they know like it's yeah. worth the investment. Yeah. Absolutely. And this uh, was this was something I also saw be very, very true in management consulting. You've got to have the right people um, up there. I remember one story that stuck with me um, on my when I got the BTS job, that was probably the hardest interview I ever did. And I get into the, the interview and it was a case study interview. And one of the things that uh, they were asking me about it was like a Oracle case. It was uh, all about software and it was quite hard to um, understand that industry for me at the time. I hadn't worked with software, software before. So anyways, I'm up on stage, I'm doing the presentation for the final interview. There's a room full of people that have been doing this for years. Some of them, Oracle is their client. Like they all know more than I do about what I'm talking about. And I'm just going through the data. I'm showing like some quick, quick ratios and different things that I think have signals to it. And one of the guys, this, I love this guy, he's a big, intimidating Norwegian dude that was real senior in the company and just knew everything. And he asked me a question and I'd give an answer. And then he'd ask me a second level question, digging down further. And I would give another answer. And then he asked me like a third level question. He was just digging, digging on like the, um, the business model of a software company and not being an expert there. I, I started to run out of, you know, answers. And at one point I just said, you know, I, I don't know, uh, that actually, but you know, I can research it and come back to you and you know, give you, give you an answer. And he was like, okay, just kind of underwhelmed, like, okay. And then afterwards, you know, I finished the thing and I meet with him out in the lobby and he comes up to me enthusiastically, just shaking my hand. Steven, you did such a great job on this interview. I love that you told me that you didn't know that's what we need. We cannot have our people going in front of clients and making stuff up. You know, you got to just like be honest about what you don't know. That's like really important in consulting. For sure. Hard though, right? Yeah. Like as a consultant, you're almost like looked to as the expert and you want to try to play that part. And mm -hmm. so, cause, cause if you don't know anything for that matter on the flip side of that is that that probably loses trust and credibility. Um, it's a balance for sure. I, I found it like almost the more I would know a company, the less I would be just giving prescriptive answers and the more I had really good at questions to ask. Yeah. It's funny, I, I've never, it took me a long time to learn this and uh, I've been blessed to be one of the most curious humans on the planet. And it's served me really well in the sense that I just naturally ask a lot of questions. Honestly, sometimes to my fault. There's been multiple people that have told me that uh, on some level they were almost offended because they thought that I was like, I don't know, questioning them as a human versus just questioning their ideas. Like I'm pretty good personally at being able to separate the idea from the person, but oftentimes people get those tied together that if I'm questioning an idea that somehow it's an attack on them. And it's definitely got me into trouble a number of times and people think that I'm like attacking them when really I'm just curious. I'm just yeah. a fucking stupid curious human. <laughs> and so luckily it's like, in the long run, it's actually served me really well of like even in sales or working with companies or clients is that I naturally just like ask a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, so generally it's helped out a lot, but yeah, there is for sure a balance there of like, you have to learn first before you can even provide useful information as opposed to just like vomiting what you think they want them to hear or what you want them to hear. Yeah. So, and you're so much more calm and poised in front of someone when you have really done the work and you've done your research and you've talked to experts and you know so much, then it allows me to not feel like I have to just move my mouth and give a bunch of answers. I can just be kind of confident and wait for what the prompt is and go back and forth because I've got this huge repertoire of like what I know. Did you, uh, you mentioned before about how you had to do like 50 phone calls before you landed your internship. 
Has cold calling been a common trend in your life? Have you had to do that in the consulting world as well or no? No, um, no, not, not exactly like that. No, Good. the way business development worked there was different. So, okay. Um, so let's fast forward then. So consulting for a long time. Um, and then eventually you reached a point where consulting was no longer the path and you started what you're doing now. Yeah. Mind sharing the story is how you got into starting this business. Yeah. Yeah. It was almost like overdue for a change. Um, I had contemplated doing a shift into entrepreneurship right about the time COVID hit. And then I thought, whoa, I'm going to kind of hold on to my seat here, stay where I'm at, who knows what's going to happen. Um, and stayed in consulting for another like two years or whatever. Um, but then I was like, you know what, I want to do something different. I don't know exactly what it is. So I was still working in consulting and about that time, about it, two years ago, I thought I really want to cold plunge. And I looked out in the market at what the options were. And I was like, you know, I just don't want to pay five grand for a bathtub and, and a chiller. <laughs> and I don't know. And so I was like, I'm just going to build my own. And I found these, uh, fishing, these industrial fishing coolers and uh, bought one from the supplier. I, I first, before I even bought my first one, I set up a wholesale relationship with them and said, I'm starting a business. I'm going to be using these. You know, I bought a few of them, you know, uh, I think I ended up selling 14 of those or something. But the first one I bought, um, I just set it up in my backyard, paid retail for the equipment and just had a cold plunge. And my friends were coming over and seeing it. And they were like, this is cool. I like this. They're like, can you build me one? And so I built one for a friend. The first one I ever built was for Jordan Winar good friend of mine lives in West Austin. He still got it. And, um, you know, he loved it. And then I'd build it for another friend. And then they're telling people, Jordan's telling people he works with. And before you know it, I'm, I'm selling seven, then 10, then 12, then 14. And I'm like, I'm going to, this is becoming profitable. I'm turning this into a business and really lean into this. And I've, that means I've got to completely redo the product. You know, it's, this is just like a DIY situation. I've got to like come up with something that's better. And so had to go through some iterations there to land where we are now. Uh, but you know, that it just sort of started off as an, ex I viewed it as an experiment. So that would almost be like a piece of advice maybe to like new entrepreneurs that are considering taking this step is if you need to, to give yourself psychological safety, view what you're doing as an experiment and the BATNA, your worst case scenario is just go back into what you're doing before, but let's just make it an experiment for six months and try it out and do some like prototyping and some beta. And so that's what I did. And it's now turned into, of course, full time. I gave that exact same advice uh, literally like, I think yesterday somebody was asking me about, they wanted a, another occupational therapist, which is what I used to do as a practice. I don't practice anymore, but they were asking me like how I got out of it and how I'm doing what I'm doing now. And my advice was literally, I was like, Yo, dude, just follow your curiosity because I think people underestimate the business advantage of having energy towards the thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like when you're just genuinely curious about it, you're going to continue to put more time and energy into it as opposed to feeling you're climbing uphill, which is honestly one of the most underrated business advantages of like caring about the thing that you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Having the passion for it. Were you using just like those giant metal trough bins like what were the first ones you were building these out of it was actually an um llpe rotomolded molded plastic a in what insulated code cooler. did you just say <laughs> it's a uh, it's it's similar to like uh, a giant yeti but yeti okay. doesn't make anything this big another company out of iowa does um, but it was 400 liters and it was the right ergonomic shape for a person to get into and then you cut a hole in it and plug a tube and yeah you drill two holes in it and then install bulkheads and that gives you the ability to have an inlet and an outlet, one high, one low, mm -hmm. and then just kind of build all the other, you know, plumbing around it and filter and pre-filter and everything else. Did any of the first, you said 14 of those things break after you built them? None of them. Wow. They're all still running strong, man. You just follow some YouTube tutorials or what? I kind of just taught myself, I mean, when I built my own, yeah. that was the experiment. I made some mistakes there. And, um, you know, after building that first one, I guess through going through the process, I built them all myself, you know? And so I learned as I went little tricks to prevent leaks or little tricks to get the flow better, or to insulate things better. And just kind of learned as I went. It's funny. I, uh, just the other day I went on a long run and it's it was 105 degrees and I'm a psychopath. So I run in the middle of the heat mm -hmm. and I got back and cause you saw, I had a cold plunge when I was out on the mount oh, on, on the yeah. farm for a so month. Good. 
it was life-saving out there to have that every single day, especially because it's so been so hot here in Texas lately. And uh, so I went on that long run and I got back and I was like, I, I couldn't cool down. So I literally <laughs> just like turned on the bathtub, just the regular tap water and went in the freezer and threw whatever ice I had in there. Yes. And just like lay, it wasn't very cold, but I just like laid down in that to do whatever I could to try to cool my body down. I was yeah. like, man, I wish I could just turn my regular tub into a cold tub. Uh, yeah. I, I legitimately looked into it. I was like, is this even possible? Yeah. And based on everything I found, it was like ice is kind of your best option. And I was like, I don't want to deal with that. So. Yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but it is a lifesaver these days. I mean, it's 105 today, so yeah, yeah. And I and I honestly I haven't been sleeping super great, and I do wonder if it has something to do with not consistently cold plunging um, as much as I was before at the farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was sleeping great at the farm, but ever since I haven't been consistently cold plunging because I haven't had it, I do wonder if that's a factor. Because I I have already heard you talk about that, mm-hmm. and so it got me thinking that maybe that is, but. I live in an apartment, so it's a little tough to have a cold plunge here. But, sure. Um, so tell us about some of the growing pains of starting this business. So I'm sure after you built these, you eventually stumbled into this idea of like, okay, I could actually turn this into something fruitful. Mm-hmm. What were some of those early days like for you? Um, early, the early days were really exciting. Um, I went and delivered every plunge myself and set it up with the customer. I wanted to meet all my customers. And here, you know, why did you decide you wanted a cold plunge? How did you choose this one? Um, and just get to know the voice of the customer for my business. And that was a lot of fun and made relationships. I guess I'm kind of friends with all those early customers. Then my first huge challenge came when I pivoted from that initial DIY looking design into something that I was hoping would be, you know, beautifully all in one, well packaged, you know, Fjord product. And I made the choice to source those machines from China. And I looked at a bunch of different um, suppliers and I tried out three of them, uh, maybe three or four actually, and had them at the house, had the machines and tested them out. And they were not three out of the four failed essentially within the first couple of months of use. Something happened. A pipe broke and Freon leaked out. The pump stopped working. The electronics you know, fizzed out, like all kinds of issues. And I was like, oh my gosh, we got to find a quality product here. Ended up going to this one supplier and they started having some maintenance issues. And I had to do some recalls, some refunds for customers that were upset. And it was not a lot of fun. Uh, It almost put me out of business. And I, you know, I just had a ton of money that I never really got back out of that. Um, So made the decision to go to what we're using now, which is an American made, um, all the key components are made in Tennessee. So it's like, you've got the chiller, the pump, everything's packaged in waterproof stainless steel, um, quality American made parts. And I pay double what I was paying for the Chinese ones. So it's hurt my economics, but it's just so much of a peace of mind to know that I'm selling something that is going to last and that's going to be quality for people. Um, and it's been a, been a hit actually business has picked up since I went that direction. Do you tell people that do you brand it that way? Yeah, we need to do a better job of messaging it. Um, but because I think a lot of times when people hear, oh, it's American made, they think, oh, cool. It's like patriotic. Um, but it's not just about, you know, patriotism. It's actually, um, you know, really exciting in terms of its ability to perform at a different level and have a higher level of durability and so forth. Yeah, I would for sure use that in a branding advantage. I mean, granted, again, this goes back to the original conversation we we're having about like understanding what people want. Um I, I would be very curious as to know if people want that because you do more often than not see a lot of the products that are out there that are, yeah, they're just like rebranded Chinese products, which if they, yeah. if they work great, cool. Right. Nobody cares. I sure. don't care. I don't, don't care where it's from, honestly, if it works well, but if it doesn't, and that is a concern in the market, that's for sure an advantage. Yeah. Um, how did you find this supplier in Tennessee? Uh, they're the only one that I'm yellow aware. books. You started calling people. Yeah, right? no, they're, they're just, they're well, well, within the, within the cold plunge industry, you know, they're most people know about them, um, because they're the only cold plunge company that is made in America, essentially the one that's actually made for cold plunge ap- applications. And it's completely dialed in and purposed for that. And it's the only one that I'm aware of. So, um, so it was easy to find them and it was just a matter of, being able to stomach the economic cost of, of doing business with them and, you know, 
doing customizations with them and, you know, you got to buy uh, in bulk to get certain customizations and stuff like that. So, you know, it's still in the process of like working with them and getting everything perfectly dialed in to be a little bit more um, unique for our offering, but it's, it's super solid. Interesting. Okay. Um, how have things been going overall then since making that pivot to using the American made product? Good, good. I think what helped us, what kind of kicked the business forward into a place of profitability happened back in May um, when we attended Hack Your Health, uh, the keto con con conference here in Austin. And it was just such a great crowd of people. We had a booth there and um, I was kind of hesitant actually at, to, to even go to the thing. It was $3,000 to have a booth. And I thought, I don't know, like, is this really worth it? It's a lot of work. It was also my birthday weekend. It's like, I want to be celebrating my birthday and uh, went and it, I probably sold nine cold plunges wow. at Hack Your Health. Wow. And I was like, this is a, such a great idea because the audience was incredibly curated. People that really cared about their health. So what has that done for you now moving forward? How has that changed the way you're looking at your marketing? Well, my avatar has shifted from what I originally thought it would be. Um, I originally thought people that would buy my customer by that would be my customers would be 25 to 35 young gym going biohackers. And what I found is it's more 35 to 55 working professionals that have really busy lives. Maybe they were former athletes and they formerly cared about fitness, but they might even not even make it to the gym very many times a week. They're looking for something that is going to be quick and easy that they can have at their house as a little five minute pick me up every day to rejuvenate themselves. And also a lot of them have kids, they have stressful careers, and this is a place for them to go and have kind of a respite and a reset and an energy boost and a kind of a mental refresh. Um, that's what I've found is a lot of my customers actually fall more in that bracket than in the young biohacking bracket. Interesting. So where do you find these individuals? So far, it's been a lot of like word of mouth um, events. So, you know, a lot of our business has been in Texas. So most of the units I've sold have been in Houston, Austin, San Antonio, uh, which sold to a gym in Kerrville um, and Dallas, Fort Worth area. And uh, well, one in Costa Rica, but that was that was an outlier. And so it's been a lot of like networking and, and uh, having events and stuff like that. You know, I host monthly events at my place. We have one coming up this Saturday. And, um, you know, that's been a great way because people want to buy from people that they know and they trust. And then you have an opportunity to show them the product. They get to try the product before they buy it. Um, so that's it's it's a small way to start. But we're a small company right now. And we're just working on a, a marketing push to start reaching out even further. I, uh, I love that shift in your avatar. That's actually interesting to me. I mean, it kind of makes sense now that you describe it. Obviously, it's hard to know that in the moment until you try it and start talking to customers, but it kind of makes sense, right? Like when I think about the 20 or 30 year old, they're especially an early 30 year old, maybe, maybe not a later 30 year old, but um, they're probably still like into the pre-workout, get a pump, get jacked. You know what I mean? That's, that's more their style of training essentially trying to attract the opposite sex which is was totally me a thousand billion percent um so the cold plunge wasn't like that important honestly i was just trying to like get jacked and pick up chicks and i'm sure girls are doing the same thing they're trying to get a butt and pick up guys right <laughs> generally speaking right <laughs> sure. like that's just kind of yeah. the stage of life that you're at uh versus like maybe yeah 30s 40s 50s for sure you're like i hurt uh i, w I don't feel great i i'm busy um, and they have the disposable income for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now that we talk about it, that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, so what's the, what's the new mar marketing push moving forward here then? So obviously you were doing the networking word of mouth events. What are things moving forward? Yeah. One of the things we're doing is, um, going after B2B a little bit more. So reaching out to gyms and studios that might not have uh, a cold plunge, but might benefit from one. Um, and then also working on kind of like just as grassroots as we can, building up an email list, continuing to build up our community and um, offer incentive to grow those types of things and then start doing some paid marketing. So we haven't really done any paid ads or anything yet. And so that's something that we're gearing up to do in the next probably four to five weeks is sending out kind of a campaign of, of paid ads through Meta. Can you do me a huge favor and yeah. start selling them to apartment complexes? Seriously. I like we were just recently in Alaska and uh, one of the things I wanted to do there because it was cold is that I wanted to sauna. And then also if a cold plunge was there, I definitely would have done that too. I couldn't find either. 
like neither of them were like anywhere to be found except for maybe like a few i think homes maybe had like a sauna attached to the building but generally speaking you couldn't just like find them out and about and around which was so annoying um but something i'm excited for and hope happens and i don't see why it wouldn't is i i think that even like apartment complexes will start including because even our gym here where i live we have two gyms and they're both amazing like they have everything you could ever want now i feel like the next thing could be saunas and cold plunges mm -hmm. I, I would hope to see more of those happening so do me a favor and sell to more apartments you got it yeah i appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> um okay so exciting new things from paid advertisements potentially um i know community is a really big deal to you obviously you touched on it briefly of this coming weekend you have an event for getting people to come and try the product um where did the love or obsession with community i think we can all agree that it's in, it's essential to just human flourishing and general well-being um where did you maybe learn that lesson and how did that come about in your life yeah i mean i've always been kind of extroverted so had a bigger appetite for being around people more often than than some others um i think it probably started even in college i was at a and oh, yeah. it's in college station there's not a lot going on in college station it's not like living in austin uh, and so really to have a good fulfilling life there you've got to get involved in student involvement clubs organizations leadership groups volunteering like so everyone's just diving into these different pods and groups of community at, at AM. and i really just flourished and loved it met a lot of great people and then when i came to austin i, I moved to dc after school um not a lot of community in dc came to austin after two years and joined a, a bible study actually at, at austin stone church and that was an awesome little community as well. Um, and I started getting, I got asked to, to lead that eventually. So I ended up kind of doing that and building community um, in, within the context of like church fellowship. And I think what's been really fun the last year and a half is then growing and developing out the Austin wellness scene and, you know, meeting more people that are passionate about what they're doing. A lot of entrepreneurs. So I had a conversation with this guy that I think both you and I know, uh, Draco uh, from the Sapien Center. Yeah. Great guy. And he came over to the last wellness event and we were talking and kind of agreeing on this matter. We were both sitting in the cold plunge and he said, man, Austin, right now in history, this is the time and place to be for like fitness and wellness. And it's like being in New York for investment banking or Hollywood for acting like this is Austin right now. Like, and we're here at the right time too, because it's just rising up and there's all these hubs and spokes. So like, I feel like Sapien Center has a fantastic community that they've developed. I respect that. Squatch has got their thing. The collective has their thing. You know, I'm a really small microcosm of it, but I'm building, you know, the Fjord community as well. And, and you've got so much that you're doing to give back and curating events and stuff like that. So um, it's a great time and place to be in Austin and in this industry too. Yeah, I've heard it described as almost like the, what do they call it? Like the, almost like the honeypot or the, the hive it's like this hive mind of health and wellness business owners and entrepreneurs or people that are just like interested in living a healthier, happier life. And then it's like, it's kind of expanding out from Austin into different areas. Cause like, dude, you get a mile or two outside of the general Austin area and you're immediately like transformed into like, Oh, like this is most of America mm -hmm. and not to talk trash. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I mean, I grew up in Minnesota and Minnesota's especially Twin Cities area is a relatively healthy area. But like generally speaking, like whenever I get out outside of Austin and travel and go places, I'm always like, again, not trying to be judgmental, but it's like people just don't care about it. They don't consider it. They're like they're super cool living on processed foods and McDonald's and yeah. going to the gas station and buying scratch offs and which is fine, whatever, if that's, if you're happy. But at the same time, it's like, <laughs> Seriously though, yeah. Actually, I, this is this blew my mind. Do you know what pull tabs are? Mm -mm. So, okay, how does nobody in Texas know what pull tabs are? So, uh, pull tabs are they're they're sort of like scratch offs, but they they're like you peel them open. They kind of got like this like perforated edge thing where you kind of peel them open. It's the exact same thing. It's it's almost like a card that kind of looks like a slot machine. So you peel it open, and then if like all the cherries line up or whatever it is, you win some money. They're called pull tabs. I used to see them uh, at like the bars back in Minnesota where like you could buy a bunch of pull tabs, you open them and you hope to win money. It's, they're just like scratch offs. Yeah. We were in Alaska and there's legitimately on storefronts for pull tabs. And I was like, no way. And I had, I was like, I gotta go in there. I was telling Michaela, I was like, I gotta go check this thing out. And I go in there 
And there's literally a guy surrounded by all these like bins full of just pull tabs. And these, this other guy was in there literally just like, I think he just like had cash and was just like buying these pull tabs, like trying to win. And it's not even that much. It's like you win, like if, if you win, you win like 50 bucks, hundred bucks. If you're really lucky, you get me like 500 bucks, whatever. Yeah. And I was like, no way. Like this is a legitimate establishment where people go in and buy pull tabs they go in it's legal gambling essentially is what it is it's like it's the loophole of casinos yeah it was like what the hell are we doing people like cool man hey more power to them but like <laughs> i mean i'm just glad we have more options in austin <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's that's totally it right it's like there's probably nothing better to do yeah oh man anyways i'm gonna get my soapbox i'm trying not to be judgmental but at the same time i was like dude like <laughs> I don't know. There's better things you can do with your life. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the future of your ahead? What do you, where do you see things going moving forward? Um, we're in a really good place right now. I feel like for the business, it gets me really excited because I feel like we've got the product mostly dialed in. There's some cosmetic things I want to do. I want to start offering a hard shell right now. We only offer um, the inflatable. I want to keep that because it's helpful for a lot of people because it's portable um, it's lighter weight, you know, and like, you know, people can move it around and take it places with them. But like, I also really like the idea of a higher end kind of aesthetic look of a hard shell, whether it's an acrylic tub or something that's made out of cedar, like kind of looking at different options right now. So that's to come that as an offering. Um, and then just man, continue to get the word out and, and selling while we still got this wonderful Texas heat. Yeah, man, this is a great time to get one if people are curious at all. Um, I, I want to get to a round of rapid fire questions, but before I do, I really want to quickly touch on your personal experience in Norway um, and doing some cold plunge sauna contrast therapy. I don't know if you told me this or I looked this up, something about a nine-year-old. <laughs> yeah, so in when I was still at, in consulting at BTS, uh, I did a project for Chevron and they do a lot of drilling off the uh, west coast of Norway, uh, right outside of Stavanger. So I took this business trip to Stavanger and I was there for a couple of weeks. So over the weekend, there was a Norwegian guy that I knew that I was friends with. And he took me out from his house. We jogged down, got kind of hot and sweaty and jogged down to this fjord. And there's a little platform to go out on the fjord and there's some locals swimming in the water. And, uh, you know, I kind of touched the water with my foot and I was like, ooh, <laughs> that's probably in the forties <laughs> somewhere. And uh, got up on the platform and I was standing at the edge of it, just debating jumping in. This would be my first real cold plunge and just debating and standing there. And then this little girl, nine-year-old girl behind me in her bathing suit says something in Norwegian to me, just kind of with some attitude behind it. I didn't know what she said, but my friend starts laughing. I said, what did she say? She goes, are you just going to stand there like a baby or are you going to jump in? And then she walked around me and dove in. Yes. I was like, I'm getting in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I had a similar experience in, uh, it wasn't a nine-year-old, so that's way worse that you had, but I had a similar experience <laughs> in Washington State. We, we found this spot where you could cliff jump and beautiful, super clear water. It was gorgeous. And there was 12 of us. I do men's retreats. We're actually doing our next one in Florida in a couple month here, maybe one month. Yeah. And, uh, but we were, one of them was in Washington state and we're all like, it, it was a slanted cliff. So you could kind of go as high as you wanted. And so like guys were kind of getting a little higher, a little higher and we're getting like 20 feet, maybe 30 feet. And like, it was getting kind of scary. Right. And all of a sudden like these, like two or three girls show up. And the one girl literally just goes to the very top of this thing. It's like 50 feet. Wow. And just like straight jumps. And we're like, all right, we <laughs> what just happened? Like, yeah. this is crazy. And then we're, we ended up talking to her and we found out actually, ironically, I think she was from Alaska <sighs> and she's like, yeah, I do stuff like this in Alaska all the time. We're like, okay. Yeah. So you're conditioned. Got it. It's really funny. A girl that's been, I've been working with lately at Fjord. She's just been so helpful with like sales and marketing coming up with uh, different strategies and stuff. And, but, uh, what the first time we were hanging out, she came over to do contrast therapy and we got in a cold plunge and it was legit cold. It was like 45, 44 and just sitting in there with her for like nine minutes. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, how can she, I've never seen really a girl like hang in the cold plunge this long at this cold. Like I do it every day. So like I'm acclimated, but this person, how did she, she do that? And we we're talking and it turns out she grew up in Alaska. <laughs> and then after that moved to Montana. So it's just like, okay, she's got some cold water behind her. She gets it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cause when we were in Alaska this couple of weeks ago, the highs were fifties and sixties. Like 
I don't think it gets warm there. Like, I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't think it's a thing. Uh, so round of rapid fire questions for you. It's whatever the first thing is that comes to mind. What's your best business advice? Best business advice is to find someone that has already done what you want to do and do everything you can to make them your mentor and just learn from them. Great advice. What's your best marketing advice? Um, for me personally, I think that it's been cool as a small business to go a little bit more the grassroots route and have build slowly, but, but confidently build your first hundred fans, first thousand fans and, um, give people incredible customer service. It's a great book. Thousand true fans. Uh, favorite part about entrepreneurship. Being able to, like you touched on this earlier, just being able to be the author of something that didn't exist and then you just create something that has value and that make people's lives better um it's just such a cool thing when are you the most productive um i tend to be the most productive after exercising or cold plunging i knew you were gonna say that <laughs> I, I feel like the, the answer had to be immediately yeah. after a cold plunge yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who is your inspiration uh, there's a lot. My parents have been big inspirations to me. I would say though, um, for people that are listening, they can also, uh, tap into this person. You probably are aware. Jesse Itzler has been kind of a mentor from afar. I don't know him personally, but I love that he talks about a life resume instead of a business resume, like build up your experiences, put Masogi's on the calendar, go out and accomplish great things. And so he's been real inspirational. Yeah, I saw a post of him recently where he literally has his big ass calendar or whatever yeah, he calls it. I've got that. You do? Okay. So yeah, he was talking about, he's like, I've already written out the most incredible year. He's like, now I just need to run the playbook. And I was like, that's actually kind of brilliant. So cool. Yeah. Easier said than done, but mm -hmm. at least having the playbook is like, you're one step closer. For yeah, sure. If you don't put it on the calendar, it might not happen. Tell me one secret or something most people don't know about you. This is kind of a lighthearted one, but for whatever reason i'm real sensitive to cold air I, I don't like being in cold temperatures when it's cold outside but i can handle cold water really well <laughs> i kind of agree i i i attribute it to acute versus chronic though i can do great in acute settings cold and hot mm -hmm. chronic though you put me in a chronically cold environment like just where i grew up in minnesota where it's cold all the time i'm pretty miserable so I, I, I don't think it's air as water as much as chronic and acute for me, but yeah, I get it. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what would you change about yourself? <sighs> to something I, I think, hopefully I'm not terrible at this, but I'm trying to work on and improve more is to be a person that is quicker and more wholeheartedly giving grace um, to others instead of like, instead of judgment. Um, I get, I get my inspiration for that from that just by looking at like, how Jesus treated people in the new Testament. He had every right to judge people, you know, but he has all these conversations. Like for example, in um, John chapter eight, where the Pharisees bring the woman in front of him that was caught in adultery. And they're like, Moses said, we should, we should stone her. What do you say? And he's like, writes in the sand. He writes the 10 commandments down in the, on the, in the sand. Doesn't say anything. Then stands back and says, well, whoever's without sin, throw the first stone. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they walk away. Hmm. And when they're all gone, he walks up to the woman and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, no one, sir. And he said, well, then neither do I condemn you. I'm just like, that is grace. All right. Well, I got chills. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what's your favorite app or resource right now? Man, probably like just one of the podcast apps, you know, um, plug for our podcast here, but no, like. Just, I mean, I get so much of my education from like Huberman and Wim Hof and Susanna Soberg and, you know, um, all those other great people out there that are putting out content, Dr. Peter Atia. So I've learned a lot through podcasts. Susanna? I've never heard that one. She's great. So Susanna, Dr. Susanna Soberg, she's a Scandinavian researcher and she really is that. She's a researcher. So she's not trying to be a big personality, but she does, she's turned into a personality because her work has been so famous and, and so well cited. So honestly, half of what Andrew Huberman cites and talks about when he talks about cold plunging is from Susanna Soberg. Wow. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, what keeps you motivated? What keeps me motivated? Um, I think I have a, a couple things. One, I have a coach. Um, I have a life coach that I work with that 
helps me be a well-rounded individual and have goals that I'm motivated towards achieving. And then I got some accountability for that. And I think also being healthy in different parts of my life is a virtuous thing that helps me be healthier in other parts of my life. So I have a healthy relationship with my girlfriend right now. It's a source of great joy and also motivation for me to then be more successful at work and more giving in my church community, for example. I like that. Uh, what's your favorite part about Austin and you can't say the people? Probably just the outdoors that we have here. You know, the ability to get out in the woods really easily. You know, I live in Bolden. You live here. Like we're close to nature, um, close to Barton Springs, all that fun stuff. Yeah, that was something that honestly surprised me about Austin in general because my girlfriend's from Dallas and there's like not a lot of places around there to like just get out into the woods and get into nature versus here. I didn't realize that because I when I moved to Texas, I basically moved straight here. So I didn't realize like when you get outside of this kind of general area or even like the West Hills area, I guess you could say, yeah, it's much harder to find like good places just because everything's private too. Like that mm -hmm. makes things really hard too. But yeah. Interesting. Uh, I have one last question before I ask that question though, I want to acknowledge you, um, for following your curiosities, for, uh, learning from so many of the mentors before you, from learning from your father and other people in your life through business and, uh, personal relationships and, um, for deciding to take that leap into starting your own business despite having never done it before. Cause I know that's tough and that's hard. And I think it's great that you've decided to do it. So. Appreciate it. it means yeah. a lot coming from you. Thanks. For sure. Um, before I ask my last question, what's your plug? Where can people find you? Uh, we're on Instagram at, at Fjord Cold Plunge. Same thing as our URL for our website, just fjordcoldplunge.com. We also have, as you mentioned, a, a little podcast that we do, how we call it a plunge cast, and it's called Freezing for a Reason. You can find that on uh, YouTube. Um, it's a great title. We'll have some more episodes of that coming out soon. Sounds miserable. Yeah, well, that's, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's warm. If it's cold, it sounds good. Um, so last question. It's whatever, whatever your best piece of advice is. So if you were to go back to your younger self or an earlier version of anyone starting their first business or starting this cold plunge business, for example, um, what's maybe the best piece of advice you'd give to your younger self or somebody else in that circumstance? Well, I'm sure everyone's different when they're younger. But um, for me, as a kid, I always, mainly by virtue of, the influences in my life at the time, real healthy parents, my grandmother. Um, I always kind of had a high self-efficacy and believed that I could achieve whatever I put my mind to. No one really ever told me I couldn't. And I think that I would say to the younger self, encapsulate that and hold on to it and carry it forward. Because even if you are young and you're starting your first business and you don't, you lack experience, being young and lacking experience shouldn't hold people back as much as they think. And, you know, you just get out there and you start experimenting, view it as an experiment, take some chances, take some risks, find some uh, mentors, some partners, some resources, and just get started because you're not going to get it right the first time. Definitely not. Great advice. Thanks for being on the show, brother. Hey, friend. Thanks for listening to the show. If you have any feedback for me about the show or any other guests you'd like to see come on, definitely shoot me a message. I love engaging with my audience so that I can provide the most value possible to the listeners. Before you go, I only have one ask of you, and that would be to check out the Health Hustle newsletter. It's three marketing tips that's written every Tuesday specifically for health-related business owners to help them attract new leads. If you click the link in the description, it'll take you to the archive of all my previous newsletters, and you can decide for yourself if it's for you. If you end up finding it entertaining or helpful in any way, you can sign up for the newsletter, and you'll get it in your inbox every Tuesday. Thanks again, and keep hustling, my friends.